And my late mother, whom some of you perhaps remember, because she was a critic and so forth in the store, absolutely loved the Mary Folgers. So I actually owned them all um, and signed hardcover editions from what, like 1990-something? Yes, 90... Wow, uh, five. Right. And I mention that because when Francine is here tonight to talk about the fifth Mary Folger, Death on Nantucket, one of her one of her tasks was to rewrite the first four Mary Folgers and sort of bring them up to date so that it would make more sense. Right? So we'll come back to that. Um, James Finn, I'm so glad to see you again. It's been a while. Yeah. Glad to be back. Yeah. Um, we've gotten addicted to Billy Boyle. My friend Dana Stabenow and I are huge um, supporters of what I thought, I have to tell you frankly, was a sort of cheesy idea for book one, you know, making him a shirt tail cousin kind of of Dwight D. Eisenhower and sending him off, you know, and I thought, seriously? But you have just written the most wonderful books. Thank you. Now, oddly enough, you and Francine wrote about JFK almost at the identical time. Yes, we did. I think probably our books came out in your part, maybe? Yeah, I think yours was a year before mine. Yeah. It's hard not to write about JFK. He's so fascinating. Well, but no, I think what's intriguing about what both of us did is we wrote about him uh, in an unexpected way during World War II. And um, I had discovered that he took off six months of um, his junior year at Harvard and traveled alone from London to Moscow and everywhere in between in 1939 as Hitler was invading, getting ready to invade Poland. Um, and he did it to research a senior thesis uh, on a dip passport by himself in a car and on trains. And um, uh, I thought nobody knew that. I mean, it struck me as a, as a lost facet of JFK's history. And um, he also was profoundly ill the whole time he was doing it, uh, as he was most of his life. And um, I had him spying for Roosevelt. But I had toyed with the idea of looking at uh, PT-109, and Jim did it ahead of me, so <laughs> that was... <laughs> and one of the things that attracted me to the Kennedy story was a friend he went to Europe with, Lem Billings, yeah. who was a lifelong friend, and who Jack Kennedy treated very well and very shabbily at the same time. He was a good friend to Lem, but if he ever needed to get out of trouble, Lem was the guy that he would blame, li literally, uh, for any uh, uh, car accidents he got in. It was always Lem that was driving suddenly. Um, so I thought that, that was an interesting window into Jack Kennedy's character. The people really were drawn to him, wanted to be near him, wanted to be in his orbit, uh, but he would very callously use them whenever he had to. Um, so with a character like that, it's you know a writer is they don't come along that often, so no surprise we wrote about them. So who knows? Might come up again. Would it be fair to say that? Well, move on here, but in a minute, because I think it's so fascinating that he was risk addicted, like many of the Kennedys. I saw it differently. I really wrote uh, Jack 1939 as a coming of age story um, uh, about a, a person who is fragile. Um, because he used to tell people when he was 21, I'm not going to see 30. And uh, he was convinced he was going to die young, and he was determined to die not in a hospital bed because he spent so much of his time at the Mayo Clinic in Minnesota um, and uh, hated hospitals, hated doctors, hated everything that they did, trying to find out what he had and could not diagnose. Uh, and that started very early. He, you know, he had the last rites of the Catholic Church at age two. Um, he was diagnosed falsely with leukemia at 17. So uh, I think often his passion for what looks like risk is simply living to its fullest. That was something that was very important to him at least when he was 21, because he could never tell from one day to the, ne to the next whether he was going to be in bed with a fever and a dropping blood cell count and everything that went with it. Um, but you know, interestingly about Lem Billings, um, he met Lem at Choate when they were both 13. Uh, they ended up as roommates at Princeton for the six, well, eight to 12 weeks that he was at Princeton for his freshman year before he had to drop out due to illness. And Lem was gay. Um, 
and possibly in love with Jack Kennedy most of his life. Uh, and Jack wanted him to be the first director of the National Endowment for the Arts when he created it as, as president. And Lem turned it down because he was afraid to appear before a congressional committee for confirmation and tarnish through his lifestyle, in his mind, the Kennedy presidency. So yes, he used him, but he also had enormous compassion and love for him at a time when that was an unusual thing for a public figure. Um, yeah, but we could talk about Jack Kennedy. All yeah, right. sorry, sorry. <laughs> That's why we're here. But I, I just have never had a chance to have the two of you together. And these, I mean, I they're two of my absolutely favorite books. The title for the one that you wrote is The White Coast. The White Coast, right? So anyway, um, if you are not familiar with Jim's books, you can read Billy Boyle from the beginning, in which the Danish court is exiled in London, and Billy's first investigation. Um, at all of Jim's World War II, they're all set in World War II, and they all take you to theaters and to um, into I, things that happen in the war that you might not have thought. In this new book, Bowering, you're in Switzerland, which proves not to be as neutral as we have been brought to believe. No, I, I came upon the idea for this book in a footnote uh, in a research book I was reading for Blue Madonna, which was last year's book which was about uh, the French underground just in advance of the uh, invasion of Normandy. Uh, and I literally, in a footnote, I saw mention of a Zionist youth group that had gone underground and occupied France and was smuggling children across the Swiss border. And I had just never heard of that. And I was impressed that there was a, a Zionist youth group that managed to survive and uh, do this work. They were also linked with the Jewish Boy Scouts of France, who were also on the underground. Uh, and it was one of those rabbit holes of research that you hear about. You hear something, and it just, that's odd. I want to know more about that. And you read more. And in dealing with World War II, you often find things that break your heart. And that's what I found when I researched that footnote. So that's how we got to Switzerland. Basically, yeah, they weren't neutral. Anybody is of Swiss extraction, excuse me. <laughs> well, you know, it's, if you look at the map, you know, it seems weird. This the anomaly of Switzerland being, you know, there went, went all around it. But, you know, it was useful. It was useful to everybody, and as you point out, surprisingly useful to the Nazis to have it neutral, not just to the Allies, and not just in terms of Red Cross work or refugees. Um, and I think that's one of the things that you explore that's pretty eye-opening. Yes, it, it was to me, too, because as I don't want to get started on Swiss banking, because I could give a lecture on uh, Swiss banking practices in the world. But um, they really laundered all the gold from the concentration camps, from the banks that were looted all across Europe, um, so that Germany could continue to buy war supplies. And, and they made bundles of money, because every time a Swiss banker did something, they took a percentage of the gold, and it just got delivered to the Swiss bank vaults and sat there, and it was laundered on paper. Um, but it really helped along the war, definitely. Were people safe if they made it to Switzerland, or was there some chance that they could be deported back? Um, no, they were not safe at all. Uh, there's some figures that approximately 100,000 Jews were turned away at the Swiss border. And when you're talking about people who had made their way through occupied Europe to try to cross the border, being turned away doesn't mean they went back to their hotel. It means they were turned over to the Gestapo on the border crossing. Um, if you've ever seen a picture of a German passport of a German Jew, it's got a big red J stamped on it. It's a familiar image to a lot of people. Well, that red J was not put there by, well, it was put there by the Germans, but it wasn't their idea. The head of the Swiss police visited Berlin in 1938, and already a lot of German Jews were trying to make it into Switzerland. And his request at the behest of the Swiss government was, could you folks make it a little easier for us to pick out the Jews? Well, okay, let's put a big red stamp on the passport. That enabled them to turn them away all the more easily. Do you want to chime in? 
No, no. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I was thinking not, I was being not. so extensively educated in the work. That, no, but I think you know the rabbit hole of research is is an interesting point. Yeah. What happens to many of us as writers is that we will stumble on something in a footnote and it starts to unroll like a piece of twine. Um, I had that experience in a book called The Alibi Club, which sprang, oddly enough, from a footnote. Uh, I had been seeing the play uh, Copenhagen, um, which is a wonderful, wonderful play about two nuclear physicists, Niels Bohr, and um, um, Heisenberg, Werner Heisenberg, who was Hitler's atomic physicist. But he had been Niels Bohr's uh, protege and student when he was in graduate school. And he went to Copenhagen to meet with Bohr. And there's something called the, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, which is invoked a lot, like you know, Schrodinger's cat. It's um, A, a motif in the play because no one knows. There's, there's persistent uncertainty as to what Niels Bohr and Heisenberg discussed in that meeting in Copenhagen. And he either asked Bohr to build the, help him build the bomb for Hitler, or he asked Bohr not to build it for us. And Bohr was half Jewish, and he was in an occupied country in Denmark, um, occupied by the Germans. So the fact that Heisenberg might have asked him to collaborate with him is, is outrageous. But whatever, whatever the conversation, the two men never spoke again. And they had been as close as father and son. Um, and three weeks after the meeting, Bohr was smuggled out of Denmark by the US and went to work for the Manhattan Project. Anyway, I decided to read the book that the play was based on, which is called Heisenberg's War. It's a wonderful book. Um, and in a footnote, it mentioned the fact that Marie Curie's son-in-law had plans for an atomic bomb at the only cyclotron in Europe in his laboratory at the Sorbonne, and was instrumental in getting the entire world supply of heavy water out of Norway before, the, before Paris fell to the Germans. And I thought, why have I never heard this? Why, why is this lost history? Well, the answer is that he died in 1955 with leukemia, as every Curie. All the Curies All did. the Curies did. Yeah, right. um, but before that, he had been in the resistance in Paris, um, building bombs in his Sorbonne laboratory for the resistance. But that meant he was part of the communist resistance, because the resistance within France was communist. After the war, if you were a communist in the late 40s, early 50s, you were shut out of nuclear research and of the history of of nuclear physics, essentially. So his story never never was told. And it's fascinating when you start going down that rabbit hole uh, and you learn more and more and you read more and more. But it is entirely specific to the topic that you personally suddenly find fascinating. So for him it was Switzerland for me, it was the French physics, you know, atomic physics program in 1939, 1940, which I never known really existed. Um, so no, I I think sometimes we become very, very well educated on the topic that obsesses us <laughs> as we as we proceed through the research path. And people will often say to me, you know, how, where do you get your ideas? And I say, because I'm doing research on something that compels me, a story suddenly forms. Um, but usually it's because I'm reading or educating myself about something I have never studied before in my life. I never write what I know. I write about what I want to learn and, and go about actually research. That's where the stories are. You can see one reason that I really love to talk to Francine is I can be in the 18th century with Jane Austen, or you've written, is it five or six books? Um, There's six, six and spy novels. Right. Um, Two of them are contemporary, The Cutout right. and Blown. Uh, the Secret Agent is the Vietnam War. Right. Um, well, it's actually it's about Thailand. And it Oz. is. Um, just for Francine, I bought four Jim Thompson shirts when I was in <laughs> Thailand. I went to visit the Jim Thompson. Um, it's so still there, the, the home. The Jim the, Thompson house, yes. Yeah. yes. Uh, the, the secret agent is about Jim Thompson, who was an American knock, a non-official cover officer for the CIA um, in 
based in Thailand, he created the Thai silk industry as, as cover, essentially. Um, and Which he just is flourishing to this still day. Still flourishing. Yes. The Jim Thompson Soap Company is a huge... Um, huge operation. Yeah, worldwide. Um, but he disappeared without trace on Easter Sunday, 1967. So um, that book is about that. But at any rate, so there's those. And then uh, three World War II books, The Alibi Club, Jack 1939, and Too Bad to Die, which is about Ian Fleming as a, an intelligence officer in 1943. And spookily enough, in August, Andrew Gross and I, in his new novel, The Saboteur, talked about the removal of heavy water, the whole oh, expedition from Norway. from Norway, which I had read about in one of Francine's books many years ago. So. Mm -hmm. And now we're in Nantucket, so, you know, I regard her as some sort of polymath. <laughs> so how did you go about, before we talk about death in Nantucket, how did you go about rewriting Mary Folger? Well, this is an interesting issue, I think, for, for anyone who reads series, but also for, for writers. Uh, I had a lapse in this series. I started out, my very first book was Death in the Off-Season, which is the first Meredith Folger book, and I wrote it. Uh, I worked as an intelligence analyst at the CIA, and I wrote it at night after work. And I found it to be absolutely liberating to write fiction because um, it was a different part of my brain. Um, and intelligence analysis is very much like journalism. It's very linear. It's very um, dominated by who needs to know what, when, and how. Um, and to write fiction was such a creative act that I felt like it unleashed um, all sorts of uh, richness in my life that I hadn't anticipated. I was suddenly creative in many, many ways. <laughs> um, and um, I could write at night with a sense of refreshment because it was so different from the writing I was doing during the day that it, time passed and I was totally unconscious that time was passing. Um, and that's when I knew that it was really my bliss. It was my, the, the bliss I had to follow. Um, <coughs> But at any rate, I chose Nantucket because if you have to live mentally in a place for the length of time it takes to write a novel, then it better be a place you love. And I am passionately fond of Nantucket. I, I uh, have been going there since I was three. I'm 54 years old, so that gives you a sense um, of the amount of time. I was a nanny on the island as well when I was in high school. Um, and the point being, I wrote four novels very closely linked in time. And then I started writing other things. And 18 months ago, maybe, or two years ago, um, Soho came to me and said, we'd like to reissue this series, and we want you to write, because it had gone out of print, we want you to write another book in the series. And I said, but there's a 25-year lapse <laughs> between book four and book five. And she said, well, you know, you have a choice. You can either set book five back in time, which was the 1990s. Do you know how god-awful the 1990s are for a series? <laughs> I mean, Cara Black disagrees with me. She sets her Emily Leduc novels in Paris in the 1990s. But for, for law enforcement, no cell phones, no digital databases, no scanners, no... I mean, it's Body ridiculous. Cams. No, Well, no, I'm, I'm thinking more of the process of detection. You know, okay. in my original book, I had a blackmail letter. Now, who writes a blackmail? <laughs> you know, you might send an e a blackmail email, but from Brazil, the character lived in Brazil, he wasn't going to send letters by mail from Brazil, you know? So I thought, if, I, if I'm going to set this book, I want to bring everything forward. I didn't want to have a 25-year uh, lapse and have my characters be 50 suddenly, when they had been 30 in the original books. Um, and so I said, I will only do this if you allow me to revise each of the novels in the series. And I went back and I rewrote all four books to bring them up to the present. But also, my god, I was a turgid writer in my first novel. <laughs> I mean, you know, there was no prose too purple. And uh, if I have learned anything about this craft in 25 You're years... You're saying terrible things about me as a reader, too. I don't I'm so sorry. You're an evil opportunity. We were all more innocent than... We were all more innocent rather <laughs> No. We've all progressed. Yes, I you know I think what I have acquired through working I I just turned in my twenty seventh novel so that gives you a sense over time that working with editors I admire and I've had three that I really value um, at different houses you learn the craft of of revising your own prose 
in a way that improves the work measurably. And so it was a godsend to be able to go back and rewrite those four books because had I published them as they were, I'd have been embarrassed by them. Now I felt like I had improved them and I could release them to the world with a sense of accomplishment. So it was a really positive process. So I rewrote the four books and then uh, wrote the fifth one, which is Death on Nantucket, which, right. which is what we're here to talk about. But, right. you know, I, I do think, I, I've had this conversation with many authors. Many of them don't ever want to read a book that they have written again, let alone think about revising it. Few of them actually have the time, you know, or the incentive to go back and revise things. I had one author that I published whose first novel was so weak it, it, it made it impossible to sell the series, the foreign rights and so forth of the series, because everybody wants to start with the first book, and if the first one doesn't work, you know, then they don't want to take the other ones. And that was really interesting for me as an editor, because what I learned from it was how little I knew back then, because that was back, you know, when we first started, probably 1999 or 2000. I didn't know enough to help them, or even to recognize Absolutely. some of the weaknesses. So, yeah. you know, I, I certainly understand what you mean when you say you progressed as a writer, because it was not that difficult to see the flaws and mm -hmm. talk to them as, as an editor. So, anyway, here we are, Death on Nantucket, which is really, it's a very hard-hitting book. There's, um, it's, it's a fascinating book, I think, a real family drama. But, you know, you're not a sentimental writer, and this is one where I think um, you took a really good look at these people. I'm not a sentimental writer, uh, because I'm not, I am, I am a sen sentimental person, okay? So, <laughs> um, it's painful how often I will tear up at things that I, I don't anticipate. But, um, about people I can be fairly hard-nosed. I think um, I wanted to examine the nature of memory. My mother died of Alzheimer's. Many of us have experience of Alzheimer's. I was intrigued that in the nature of memory is such that you, you share your memories with the person who helped form them. And that in a way, they're a bridge between you. And when one of the people in that relationship ceases to remember things correctly, you lose a whole part of your own memories somehow. It's a very unreal situation where you're not sure what actually happened if it no longer exists for that person. Um, so that was one aspect. But then I was thinking about fictionalized histories. And in particular, um, storytelling adept storytellers. There's a club on Nantucket called uh, the Wharf Rats Club. It's very, very old. Franklin Roosevelt was um, inducted into it when he sailed into Nantucket Harbor in 1933, um, but it predated him. And it is just a, a club for storytellers. It began as a fisherman's tall tale club. Um, and the only way you, you are invited to be a member you can be an islander or you can be a summer person, but you have to have a gift for telling stories. And there's a sign over the door that says, no room for the mighty, which means you can't buy your way into the war fronts. A number of foreign correspondents during the Vietnam War had ties to Nantucket, the most famous um, being um, Daniel, yeah, David Halberstam. Um, he lived there, you remember, he mentioned before he died. Yes, uh, and, and others. Um, Tim Russer lived on Nantucket, the had a house on Nantucket, I used to see him there a lot. But um, I was thinking about the stories foreign correspondents tell, and how perhaps the history that's been received and believed by everyone for years is a fiction. And when the person in question's mind begins to go through dementia, what actually starts to emerge is the truth. So his memories have been carefully staged his whole life, and all of a sudden they start to unravel, and what comes out is something totally different. Uh, so I was kind of thinking of the inverse of what we normally think of as dementia, that, that 
that people forget in this beginning. This guy is actually forgetting to control and remembers. He's forget yeah. He's lost control of the story. Of the which construct. wasn't a true story. It was a yeah. construct. Right. So anyway, that's that's the central issue of the book. But as this is happening, his family is deconstructing around him because they've always had one version of the past and now they're having a different version of the past. So let me ask you this, in all of your talk, um, or your research and so forth, into the Second World War, there are so many different perspectives, so many stories that different, so many constructs. That's really what interests you in all your books, isn't it, Ron? It is, and I found that there are truths that exist on both sides, that some of the myths and beliefs we have about the war um, are true, and the obverse of them is true at the same time. Um, there was a, um, we all know about the Band of Brothers, the, um, the series about the 101st Airborne. Uh, so I, I have a lot of reverence for the, those guys, that series, how well it was done. And then when I was researching the book, uh, the, the one about the blacks and uh, the blind goddess. Um, I came across several uh, stories about how um, the men of the 101st who were stationed in England before the invasion um, reacted very badly to the presence of black troops in the area. Uh, and in the opening scene of that book, um, there's a, a black soldier who was called upon Billy Boyle to help him, and they meet in a um, pub, and the pub has had every single glass shattered, and it's because that town had been ba it's, uh, based as a, uh, a town for black troops to take their liberty, but they, there was just a rule that changed it for white troops, because there were more white troops coming in, and men from the 101st Airborne came in with baseball bats. And this is a true story. Smash every glass in every pub in this town because they didn't want to drink out of the same glass where the blacks had. And, and at the same time, those are the heroes in band. I mean, I'm not saying those exact men, but at the same time, those guys are also heroes and, and did incredible things. Um, so those things, what I find those truths that oppose each other but are true at the same time, that's where I know that there is a story. story. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, certainly, history is generally written by the winners. Um, so you only have to watch a Shakespeare play, for example, to see you know the Tudors came out on top. Um, but I think what's interesting is you know, eyewitnesses often contradict each other because people see different things. That's why, you know, it's very difficult in a in a legal situation when you have people come in and testify about what happened and you get all sorts of conflict, you know. So certainly when you're looking at a stage as big as the Second World War, you would not you may have lots of, of different perspectives and lots of fragments to deal with. So it would be hard to know maybe they're all true in their own way. Maybe they are, and another contradiction that I just found, I just read a terrific nonfiction book called uh, La Parisiennes by Anne Seba. And it's a, it's a brand new book, and she looks at the women of Paris in particular and how they weathered the, the occupation. And what's really startling about it is it's a complete reversal of the story. It's really a feminist take on what women went through both as collaborators and resistance and, and people who tried to stay neutral. Um, and one thing that comes to mind is you've all seen those films of women getting their heads shaved uh, by the French after the liberation, women that have uh, collaborated or had German boyfriends. Um, and when Anne Seba looks into that, she finds that there, there was some of that. There were some women who were pure fascist collaborators. Um, there were women who were punished for having liaisons with Germans. But also, it was a lot of men who had been impotent 
for four years and repressed by the Germans and afraid to act out, all of a sudden could take all their frustrations out uh, on any powerless people who were handy. And who's powerless in society? Women. Uh, and it just made me look at that whole um, vision and legend of the French liberation that we have in an entirely different way. Um, and that's another, that's the next book. That's another rabbit hole. Uh, the, uh, just really quickly, there's two phases to the liberation. Um, the initial phase, as soon as a French area was liberated from the Germans, but before there was any government, they call it, it sounds better in French, but they call it the wild purge. Over 10,000 people were murdered, uh, extrajudicial killings that nobody uh, tried to, to stop. Uh, and then as soon as the Gaul, this forces entered the area and set up a government, they began what they call the legal purge. And there were trials and people were sentenced to be hung. Most of them got their sentences commuted, but the wild purge, that's, that's what I'm fascinated about, is there was really a lawless period where accounts were settled may or may not have had anything to do with the war. But again, we think of the French liberation resistance you know, as a romantic uh, period in some cases, but there were horrible things that went on under the guise of that. Um, so that's the contradiction. Who tells that story about shaving the heads of these women? The men who did it or the women themselves? We know the answer to that. History isn't just written by the winners, it's also written by the survivors. And many times they have sort of an interest in, you know, polishing up the story. You know, Francine, I was thinking while you were talking about the memory thing, in, in writing about Jane Austen, the person that you most wish had left witness is Jane, but unfortunately, all we, you know, there's, you have her letters, but her sister. Her letters are great. Right, yeah, but her I, sister also burned an awful lot of, didn't she, or disposed she of? She destroyed uh, certain letters that she deemed People argue whether she deemed them too personal or too vicious. Right. Uh, Jane had a habit of making fairly um, striking comments about family members, and Cassandra didn't want them to see them after Jane's death. So that was part of it. Um, but yes, uh, I, I do think actually that we have excellent witness for Jane uh, because of the letters, uh, which there are 158 of, and um, they span from uh, when she was 20, about the first one, uh, until her death. Uh, so when you're, writing, when you're writing the Jane series, is that the primary source that material is, primary is Jane's source letters? That and her novels, but really the letters, because the voice of the letters is much more intimate. Um, it's unedited. It's far closer to sitting down and having a conversation with someone, albeit in the diction of 1810. Um, but you get the details of the weather that day, what she ate, um, what is blooming in the garden, where she went shopping if she's in London, what she bought, what she paid for what she bought, um, uh, what she read in a paper, which tells you that she did read daily papers, several of them. Um, and so you get all this... Who was she writing to? Her sister Cassandra. Often. She was one of eight children, and the two, there were six boys and two women in the family, and the two sisters neither married, and so um, when they were apart, just as we would email anybody, or text somebody, or for Donald tweet, um, <laughs> she would sit down and write a letter every single day. Uh, often she would write a letter over several days, um, and so, for certain periods of her life, when I've, I've I've made a decision in the 13 novels I've written about Austen, um, I make one of two choices. I either set a novel in a gap in the correspondence, which I can then fill with fiction, or I set a novel in a period rich with correspondence, so that I have a virtual roadmap to everyone she met during that period of time, where she went certain days, if she's ill on a particular day, I include it. Um, and so the books vary in that respect. Some are very much fictional constructs, and others are mosaics, pastiches of a great deal of fact. Um, 
Jane in the Water of the Map is an example of that. That is the most recent book um, in that series. And it's set during the period in 1815, November of 1815, um, five months after Waterloo, when she was living in uh, London with her brother and was proofreading um, uh, her novel, Emma. She was negotiating the sale, and it's fascinating because she writes a great deal about the publishing business, about um, wanting to control her copyright, because when you sold a book in her day, you sold the copyright, so you never earned another penny from it. She basically negotiated a deal with a publisher um, whereby she essentially had paid him to, do, to print the book, and he got a percentage of the cost of the book back, but she kept the majority of it. It was a very modern approach, and it tells you a great deal about her, her hard-headedness as a businesswoman. Um, her brother was ill at the time, so she was there partly to nurse him back to health, but she negotiated all this basically on her own. She would use her brother as a foil, because men were the people that a publisher wanted to do business with, but she was the person executing the, the terms of contract. Um, she'll comment on the, the proofing process. You know, it's, it's, it's a fascinating body of letters for these reasons. Um, Sarah's the one before the Christmas one, the one that you wrote in the gaps? Yes, Jane and the Canterbury Tales. much Tale. more fictional. Jane and the Canterbury Tales. Oh, the Christmas one. Right. The actual Jane and the Twelve Days of Christmas. Yes, that is very much. Right. And that's where Jane actually has the bitchiest voice by far, if I can say that. I love Jane in that book. It's a Christmas book, and Jane is like, oh, you know. Um, Too much family. That, but, but I love it because Too much family. it's easy to think of her as, you know, not for if you. If you read Francine's books, you will have a different picture of Jane Austen than you might otherwise cherish. I love them all. Um, I've read them all, I've reread many of them. Uh, but that one I thought was where you maybe gave freer reign to the chain of the letters in terms of well, the there voice was a particular of her reason. comments. Yeah, there yeah. was a particular reason. She um, went back home. So she lived in, in um, Chawton, which is a town in Hampshire. Uh, but she'd grown up in Steventon, which is in North Hampshire, and um, north of Basingstoke slightly. Not a huge distance as the curve lies, but in, in her time period, it was an entirely different part of Hampshire. So uh, they all went back to her childhood home, which at that point was owned by her brother, James, who was the eldest child, also a clergyman. She was the daughter of a clergyman. He had inherited his father's living, which meant he was the clergyman after his father retired, and, um, and, the, and the house that Jane had grown up in. Um, and uh, she really could not stand James. She and James did not get along well. Or his wife, if I recall. Or his wife. Yeah. Could not stand his wife. His wife's sister, she was extremely close to and lived with. So it's an interesting dynamic, but none of them liked poor Mary. They all preferred Martha. They all wished James had married Martha. Eventually, her brother Frank loses his wife, uh, who had borne him 11 children, and my God, marries Martha. <laughs> yeah. At the age of 62, um, Martha gets married. But at any rate, um, the point being, because she was with James and Mary and she really didn't enjoy them and they were passive-aggressive people, um, a lot of that bitchiness is, is about their dynamic. So. I think anyone who's had to sit through a, a forced meal with relatives or friends or whatever one wishes one didn't have to sit through <laughs> can really, can really enjoy this book. But um, back to you. Um, I think all of your your subjects and countries are completely fascinating. You, your book that takes place at the Vatican made it clear to me. Um, there's a lot of bad press for the Pope, you know, that he mm -hmm. should have done, could have done a lot more to help people during the war. If you read Jim's book, that I can't remember the title. I'm sorry. Death Store. Death Door, you really gain an appreciation for what it would have been like to have been in this little tiny place entirely ringed by Nazis, you know, soldiers and all the rest of it, and and 
trying to, you know, harbor people or trying to do things, and yet one little step over the line, they could come in and wipe the entire thing out. I don't think I ever really appreciated the delicacy of that position and the trades that they were forced to make. Maybe not, maybe they weren't as courageous as one would wish or something, but on the other hand, it's an institution that had been there for centuries, and I'm sure that weighed on them, you know, as they didn't really want the whole thing, St. Peter's and all, to, to be blown up on a pretext. The Nazis were not famous for their restraint. <coughs> I, the title Death's Door actually comes from a door to St. Peter's Basilica. And when we went there to visit, to research, uh, I looked at this door and it was shut. And there's all these great scenes of death carved in, just horrible deaths, crucifixion and torture. And <coughs> so the guide said, that's Death's Door. The, it's only used to bring people, dead people out of the basilica. So the only way you get through that door is feet first. And so I thought, oh, that's, a, that's a title right there. And I got it. But it turns out they didn't do those carvings until after the war. <laughs> but it still was the door that the pillows came out. But anyway, to your point, it, yes, there's a lot of controversy about the Pope and the Second World War. But one, the thing I learned that most struck me is what you mentioned about how they view time. The, Catholic Church, the hierarchy, they think in terms of centuries. So there are people during the war who are thinking in terms of this day, or will I survive this day? And they, they're thinking of the church and will it survive this millennium? Uh, and it really was a, a different way of looking at it. It doesn't excuse everything, um, but there, there, there were a lot of complications in how the Vatican had to situate itself in relation to uh, their being surrounded by the Nazis and being a, a sovereign nation state uh, within occupied Rome. So uh, it's, and th that to me is such an enjoyable process to write a book where there are no easy answers, mm -hmm. but um, you let the character find that out because that, that's my journey. And the same thing happened to me in the book set in Northern Ireland. I'm Irish American. I grew up, even though my dad was very conservative about what was going on in America, American politics, he was an IRA supporter. Uh, so, because his family, come, my family comes from Ireland. So I grew up on tales of the brave IRA lads. And there's one book that's set in Northern Ireland. There's a theft of guns uh, that are destined for the IRA, and that has to be investigated. And I learned more than I wanted to know because it was personal for me. And my, the myths of my youth were busted. Fortunately, I have an Irish American character, so I transferred all that to poor Billy, and, and he got dissolution. <laughs> so you've been moving through the war, um, and now you're coming up on the end. Very slowly. <laughs> well, I don't, yes, I mean, well, well, why you don't, you know, as a humanitarian, you want it to be over. As a reader, you really don't want Jim to write his way out of the war, and I won't even ask what might happen to Billy, but I will say, because Francine and I are big admirers of Joseph Cannon, that one of his very best books, I think, is Temple Passage, I love uh, which really, you know, what happened when the war ended, because it didn't just all go away. You know, what, what choices did people then have to make with their lives? Billy has gone from being a Boston cop to working, you know, in the, in the military as a... Is he actually in the CID, or is he there kind of as a... No, he's, he's just in his own office. He right. butts heads with the CID. So he has that kind of protection from, quote, Uncle Ike, right? Um, but anyway, he's not in Boston, and he's right. not in the Boston police. So I'm sure he'll hang around. I'm sure he'll get stuck in post-war for a while. Uh, for a while. Yeah. 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 Oh yeah, <laughs> lots of stuff that can happen. Um, but anyway, uh, what is it that has sparked your imagination? Because every place is different that, that Jim writes about. Every theater of the war, we've been in North Africa, we've been in Italy, we've been in Sicily, we've been in Ireland, we've been in the Japanese theater. But is that the only one, or that is the only one, the JFK book where you're in the in the Pacific Theater, right? I had a lot of people ask, 
will you ever get Billy to the Pacific? And I couldn't figure out a way to do it. Um, not with Ike. Not with Ike. Yeah. yeah. Um, or a way that even just made sense. And then I started reading more about PG-109 and Jack Kennedy, and I looked at when the PG-109 event happened, and I looked back, and I should say I planned it, but in between, I think, the third and the fourth book, there's actually a gap of three months that are unaccounted for. Uh, and that was just the, the time when PG-109 happened. So I thought, aha, recent documents have surfaced, and now the story can be told. Oh my god, it's like Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> it's the battered yeah. silicon dispatch box that suddenly appeared. I made that prologue, I guess, so realistic that some reviewers actually said, James Benn has unearthed secret documents. <laughs> <laughs> no, that part was made up. Yeah, that, that's a really interesting thing. Francine is writing in, you know, in the interstices of the real life of Jane Austen. You may have created Billy Boyle's life, and now you may have to do what she does, but you're going to have to go into Billy's. <laughs> that's really an interesting thought. I had a terrible experience with that, which I'm just going to share. Okay. Um, I, in my very first Jane Austen novel, wrote a forward as editor of her recently discovered detective diaries. And there was a note in the co on the copyright page of the hardcover that said, you know, everything pertaining to the discovery of the Jane Austen diaries is purely fiction and from the mind of the author. It was a framing device. Rather like Dr. Watson saying he wrote the accounts of Sherlock. It's a framing device. Well, they left that note out of the paperback edition and every subsequent edition. And so some people honestly think I have found Jane Austen's diaries. One of them was my mother. <laughs> <laughs> this was before, before she had all time. She was like, she called me, she was now, and Fancy, I forget. Did you find these? And I said no, and I explained it to her. But that wasn't the awful thing. The awful thing was, I get a phone call one day from a newspaper in Lyme Regis, England, which is the setting of the novel Persuasion, Jane Austen's novel Persuasion. I had set my second Jane Austen mystery there. It's called Jane and the, yeah, the Cloth. It's about smuggling. Um, the gentleman of the night, as they were known in, in Austen's time, smuggled everything from coffin nails to silk to playing cards out of France because Britain had a blockade against the continent. Okay. okay, so I get a phone call from this newspaper in Lyme Regis and it's a reporter and he says, can you comment on the filming of your novel that's about to commence in Lyme? And I said, the filming of my novel? <laughs> well, it turns out a, a Canadian woman <clears throat> had read my book, and she had approached me with the request that she be allowed to write a screenplay for it, and I, she didn't want to pay for the rights, and I said, no. Because when you sell the rights to a novel in a series, you are selling the rights to the character. So it was a huge issue. She went ahead and wrote the screenplay, and she sold it to a production company from South Africa, and they were getting ready to film the story. Um, so she then sent me a, a cease and desist letter, a do not compete letter, saying that I was not allowed to in any way affect her production. So my husband's a lawyer. I, you know, he sent a lawyer, what he calls a lawyer gram, which was, you know, <laughs> you know the only actual property rights to this. She sent back a letter saying, well, I have something to tell you. We went to Jane Austen's cottage in Charlton. They have never heard of you. They have never heard of her detective journals that you claim to have edited. And I'm as much right to this story as you do because it happened in Jane Austen's life. <laughs> I said, it happened in my head, sweetheart, okay? <laughs> yeah, she believed it word for word. She thought I had written a... She thought she had read Jane Austen's diary. And she was just writing a screenplay about events from her life. God, what a nightmare. <laughs> what a nightmare. What happened? 
happened? Were you able to get her to cease and desist? <laughs> Eventually, but it took about two years. What happened, yeah. fortuitously, is the producer of the South African production company was killed in a car accident. Were you anywhere near South Africa? There's a book here. <laughs> Was there any suspicious circumstances? Yes, I'm sure it was. I'm sure it was. <laughs> that man was did. poisoned. <laughs> oh, my lord. Uh, yeah. no, so. That's really... You've never told me that story. No, what happened? For 20 years. They wear framing devices, people. Oh, they get you into all kinds of trouble. Oh, that reminds me, actually, of a really funny story, which has nothing to do with this, but apparently somewhere in Australia, and I don't remember who was telling this, somebody got the idea that they would like to reprint the Jane Austen novels, so they went to an Australian publisher and they said, you know, these are just wonderful books and we'd like to, you know, they had designed the whole bit, and apparently whoever the publisher was looked at them and said, well, is she available to tour? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so not everybody Mary she knows Jane Austen. But you know, we haven't we haven't really said who Mary Folger is in this whole conversation before we take some questions. She is in fact a policewoman. She is a cop on Nantucket and the daughter of a cop. So we might just want to mention that. Yes. So with the microphone. What struck me about Nantucket is I what struck me about Nantucket as ideal for a murder mystery setting is that it is very much like a small English village. It's very isolated most of the year. Uh, the population is very circumscribed. It's cut off by weather. Um, like an English country. Like else. an English yeah, country, really yeah. Um, and it's a, it's, I think what interests both of us, Jim, is um, the nature of, of conflict in its setting. So there's an inherent conflict in Nantucket, which is the islanders who love the place have deep roots there, have been there since six, the 1600s as a whaling community with a rich history. Um, can no longer afford to live there. Um, half the island is open space, which means that the other half of the island is as profoundly contested as Aspen uh, in terms of ownership uh, because it's a dwindling supply of, of luxury homes that go for insane prices. Um, to people who have no real ties to the island but flying for two weeks with, in their private jet with their support staff, their personal chef, and, and sort of move into that particular house of theirs for, for two weeks. Um, that kind of split in the population between the cops, the firemen, the teachers, the dentists, the people who work at the one hospital, um, you know, the coaches on the football team, on the island football team. Um, and, and these people who sort of are parasitic, except sustain the economy, um, to me is, is, a, is a venue right for murder, you know. So, um, Mary represents a deeply ingrained island family, the Folgers. The, the island was founded by four families. The Macy's, who created Macy's department store, the Folgers, the Starbucks, there's a reason it's coffee, um, and um, the coffins, which is spelled as one would expect. Uh, so she's descended from that family. And you still see Folgers on the island, and, and there are coffins that I know go back every summer. And, um, so it's a deeply rooted history. But her father was police chief, and her grandfather was police chief before him. And there's almost an expectation that she will be police chief, except she's not. And um, there are reasons for that. And in this book, her father is retired after scandal in book four. And um, she's got a new boss who is culturally very, very wrong for the island. So that's, that's an interesting thing. And there's a, there's a long-term relationship also that goes on that, you know, so I think they're fascinating. I didn't even know about cranberry bogs until I read Death, read Death in the Off Season because I grew up in the Midwest. And, you know, what you're talking about is true of Martha's Vineyard where my husband spent, you know, summers as a kid. Santa Fe, Aspen, lots of communities. Um, the tricky part though is if you're in Aspen or you're in Santa Fe, 
and you are forced to find affordable housing. So in Aspen, you have to move 20, the people who sustain Aspen, teachers on high school. Right. Yeah, you have to move 20 to 25 miles out, you're in Basalt or Carbondale, as they're right now. But if you, you know, if you move 25 miles out of Nantucket, you're in Hyannis. And there are people on, on Cape Air who, they have a commuter ticket book. Because there are people who fly in every day and their commute is 10 minutes across the sound. And they're working in construction, but they can't live on the island. So they, they fly back and forth every single day. If you watch Shetland and, and Cleves' series, there's a whole commuter thing that goes on there between the people who live on the islands and people. I love that series. But if you've watched it, remember how much time you actually spend on the ferry? You know, um, people coming and going. But you know, for a crime writer, that's a really good thing because that means that there are new people coming in and yes. it's not turning into Cabot's Cove, I knew, but there's legitimate <laughs> reasons for, um, you know, for people to move in and out. Your problem is different in that you've got these huge theaters with masses of people and, you know, various. So your problem is actually focusing on a few out of many. Right, and I also do, do need to follow the course of the war. So the, right. the, the storyline is somewhat circum, circum, circumscribed. Thank you. You're right. <laughs> um, uh, and that's one reason I've really come to respect the genius of Philip Kerr and his Bernie Gunther series. Yes. Because he wrote it, so he just hops around. Yeah. One book is in 1935, the next one's in 1935. And also other countries, because he's been yeah, to Argentina and the French yeah. Riviera. Yeah. That's actually my favorite book, is the quality of, is it the quality of? Mercy? No. I, that's what you well, want to call it, but that's not quite it. But anyway, he's at the, the French. He's at the, the hotel. Or something. Yes, he's working as the concierge, and he gets into the Somerset mom right. crowd by filling in as a fourth, playing really bad bridge. I used to be a tournament bridge player, so I really related to that. But you're right, it is genius that he is able to be so fluid um, in time. And you know, in fact, if you write your way up to the end of the war, then you do have the opportunity to go back and fill in, as you have mentioned. Well, um, how about questions from all of you? I know we, Francine could be an event all by herself, right? <laughs> Doing three or four different things here, but um, it, I don't know which of her books any of you have come to relate to, whether it's the new ones or the older ones, but feel free to ask a question about anything. Of either of us. Yeah, questions of, to either of us, right? <laughs> oh, yes. No, absolutely. <laughs> Sorry. I, I, I just want to ask Jim anything. You know, ask, me, ask, me, <laughs> ask Jim about Francine's books. That's oh, your that's best strategy. Question, <laughs> yeah. 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 Just, I think you were first at the menu. Uh, Francine, uh, question is for you, and I'll preface it by saying I've been a fan of the Murray Folger books since they came out. Oh. I haven't read the updated versions yet. Uh, but uh, I'm not sure if this is a fair question to ask an author, but if you could bring those, if those characters came to life and you could meet one of them from the from the Mary Folger novels, who would it be and why? Hmm. That's a great question. That's a really interesting question. Yeah. Uh, do you need me to repeat it? Yes. The yes. The question yeah. is if I could bring any of the Meredith Folger Nantucket characters to life and meet one of them, who would it be and why? Um, <clears throat> I think it might be Rafe De Silva which is probably not the answer you were expecting. Uh, Rafe De Silva is um, <clears throat> a foreman on the Cranberry Bog, um, and he is, as many New Englanders of the fishing community are, um, Portuguese-American. Um, he's a war vet, and um, I haven't reached the extent of my knowledge of Rafe yet. Let's put it that way. Um, Meredith's grandfather, Ralph Waldo, is very near and dear to my heart. He's based on my father-in-law. He was, he was turning 90 in December and uh, is an incredibly vital, fascinating man. Um, so I feel like I have met him. <laughs> Peter Mason, who is Meredith's love interest, is very similar to my husband. Um, so I guess, you know, I would be interested in, in knowing Will Starbuck because I've raised two boys and raised a silver probably. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for the question. Which of your titles was the one that uh, took place in Switzerland or was based on that? Uh, this, this new one. This is the new one. The devouring. Okay. Right here. Right. 
You don't you don't have to read them in order because they're all very different. Although there, there's some things about relationships that go on, um, but you know you don't. I mean, I've read them in order, obviously, because I've read them as he's written them. Actually, I've read Francine in order, because she's written everything. Um, but you don't you don't have to do that um, in order to enjoy them. That's an interesting question, though, that this gentleman asked for you. You know, who would, who would you want to spend time with? I know who I would. Um, actually, I would want to spend time with uh, Kaz, who is Billy's Me Polish... Too. Uh, Me too. That was kind of nice. <laughs> right. and, and, uh, he's a Polish count. He's very rich. Um, but I just started thinking about him because one reviewer mentioned that Kaz seems to be doing more of the heavy lifting in this book. Um, some of it is because he speaks a million languages and they're in Switzerland. But I realized I, I am tending to like him more. He's really more like me. He's a bookworm. He's the one who reads everything and every now and then Billy will say, how, how does Kaz know that? And my wife will also say that like when I come up with some useless piece of trivia. How do you know that? Um, so I, I don't know if it's I would most like to meet him or I think he's most like me, but there we go. I've enjoyed your book so much. How did Billy Boyle, just the name of the character come about? It has a nice little rhyme to it, Billy Boyle, Billy Boyle. Uh, he came about because I had a contractor doing work on my house and his name was Billy Bishop. <laughs> and, I don't know why I changed it to Boyle, I don't remember, but then, the th now I was born in New York City, I'm a Yankees fan, but Billy Boyle from Boston just kind of tripped out of my mouth, and that's how it got that Cool. Way. Why did you decide to make him a, a sort of cousin of Eisenhower? Was it just to give him the freedom to do stuff that a regular soldier would have been able to do? Yes. I, I didn't want to have to come up with a million reasons why he went here or he went there. He works for Ike. Ike wants him to go here, he goes. So it's a, it's a device that um, just enables him to be a side. And also, as you mentioned before, he's protected. You know, I, Ike is his boss, so a lot of the brass can't interfere with him, and that's a useful. And if you want to know how that can go, I am crazy about the books of Martin Limon, another Soho author, who has two um, Eighth Army CID officers as his protagonist. He's written 12, but he'll be here on October 4th with the 12th one. They're set in the mid-70s in Korea, so it's after the war, but in the occupation. And, you know, fantastic they books. are truly Absolutely fabulous books, but the sort of thing that Billy is avoiding by being related to Ike is not an option for, I call them the Slicky Boys because that was actually the title of the second book and they're actually, uh, one of them is Hispanic, who's Sueño, and the other, um, Ernie Bascom, is not, but I, I honestly think they're some of the finest war novels, you know, not war novels really, but imagine taking a whole group of, you know, kids essentially plopping them down in a completely foreign culture at a time when there was no easy back and forth or anything. And how would they behave, you know? And, and how do you protect them from the Koreans and the Koreans even more from the 8th Army boys and, you know, all the rest of it? I just finished editing a book today, which I'm truly wild about. I have a, an Indian, he's Sikh from India and educated at Cambridge, but lives in India. So he's written one book, and I just finished the second one, and he's writing about the Raj in 1910 and now 1911 from the perspective of Indians living under the Raj rather than Britons trying to figure out um, figure out India. But um, what he has to say about the, you know, the, the cultural opposition and about the incredible hypocrisy of the British. And he's, he's set up a Durbar, which is this huge celebration where George V is going to go and be crowned the King Emperor in India. And and how, is the, how did the British cope with, you know, the gambling and the press? It's like the Super Bowl. Honestly, I thought about that because that happened here. Do you know there was actual, you know, prostitution and, you know, um, trafficking and women and, you know, get all the rest of it. It's not any different today. 
but you know that's one of the things that he's dealing with um, and that's what actually Ernie and you know George are dealing with in Korea because they said you know all around the 8th Army bases are these you know encampments it's fascinating another pitch for Sobo right anybody else have a question question on that case how about thanking our authors for coming to <laughs> We would like to thank you because you've made it a wonderful evening for all of us. The most exciting part for me is wondering if this damn water bottle is going to go. So I gave it to me.